Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this episode of the Akal and Coca Reports. We are delighted to have two guests, two special guests for this very special episode today. We have uh, John, who's a patient who came to see me for a second opinion. So we're not, we don't have an ongoing relationship, but he came to see me for a second opinion uh, regarding his cardiac condition back in 2019. And, uh, and our second guest is Dr. Mandrola for his, I think, his fourth appearance on the Akal and Coca. Uh, report. We're delighted to have you both. Welcome both to the show. Thank you. So, Thank you. yeah, I, I want to, so for the audience, I want to say that this is, um, the format here is going to be very similar to uh, an episode that Dr. Koka conducted just a couple episodes back. I think it was episode 172, where Dr. Koka had a, a, a guest, a patient of his, uh, who had a, a story that is similar in some ways to John's story and and very different in other ways, um, but but it's the same thing. We, we, we're gonna have John today give us his testimony and we'll ask Dr. Mandrola, who hasn't heard the story to, to sort of react to, to that story. And, and, and you know, there may be some lessons to, uh, to learn or it, it's, I think it's a fascinating, uh, very interesting story and very pertinent to the practice of, of uh, medicine. So John, go ahead and, and uh, uh, tell us, there's an event that happened to you, a dramatic event that happened to you in October 2019, and I want you to tell you the, tell us the story, tell the audience the story, but uh, give us any background you want to give us first about, um, about you. Yeah, hello, thanks for having me. My name again is John. I'm uh, 61 years old, and I think I'm in pretty good shape. I take good care of myself. I've always been physically active and very involved in athletics my entire life. I have primarily been a runner since I was in college and you know, regularly racing and competitive up into my 50s. In my 50s, I joined a triathlon club locally and I've been training since then regularly with some pretty solid triathletes, some of them with very accomplished Ironmen. So our Saturday rides are, are not your typical coffee sh shop club ride. We push ourselves hard and most of them are probably 10 years younger than me. So it keeps me pretty sharp and pretty strong. And uh, so I've been primarily focused on cycling the last few years. I'm very, very disciplined in my training, uh, probably work out six days a week, 15 hours a week. And uh, I wanna say that I got into the technical gadgetry of the age, you know, I've got the Garmin Connect and the Monstrava, and, and I'm always watching the performance metrics, my heart rate and how many watts and miles and elevation of climbing. So I have a, a big database over time of my cardiac performance. So let me just take you right to the event you talked about, which was almost exactly two years ago in September. I had uh, developed, and I'm still on this training routine where on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and Fridays, I, I work out on the bike. I do a, a triple workout on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And on the third workout of those days, I ride up a local mountain that's in my backyard. I'm very fortunate to have one of the best cycling mountains in the world right in my backyard. And my practice had become to just ride up that thing halfway as hard as I possibly could, which is about 30 minutes it would take. And I'm pushing myself past my limits. And, you know, for those of you who aren't cyclists, uh, it may be kind of hard to understand what that's like, but when you're climbing, it's actually quite a painful experience. You're, you know, you're a sub aerobic or whatever you say it for 30, 30 minutes, your body's screaming, stop, stop, stop. So this is when the problem happened. It was on a Thursday night, but it wasn't just any Thursday night because my daughter was getting married that weekend, Saturday. And I had a rehearsal dinner on Friday and the in-laws had just come in that evening. And so there was a lot going on. I had a speech to give at the rehearsal and I had a toast at the wedding and I had a wedding arch to get and I had to get a rental truck and get you know, the liquor to the venue. And I, I had a lot of stress on me. So it might have been the perfect storm, but anyhow, I'm riding up this mountain and usually people don't pass me, but two cyclists passed me and first let them go. And then about, they got about half a mile ahead of me. I said, you know, I bet I can catch them. 
and the competitive juices kicked in and I started riding harder than ever before. I caught them and I feel kind of silly when you catch up unless you pass them, right? So I passed them and then I was in an all out race going harder than I've ever pushed before. And I broke away from them I got about a hundred yards ahead and then I felt dizzy. There's no way I was gonna maintain that pace, but I just felt this wave of dizziness said, oh, I gotta stop. I stopped, slowed down. They whizzed by me, thought, what's with this crazy guy? And, and then before I could even unclip, boom, I, I passed out. But I popped right back up. And I know I popped right back up because I've got GPS running, I got that Garmin 235 watch going, and I know that no time elapsed from the time I went down to the time I got up and moved, walked the bike to the side of the road. So it was pretty instantaneous when I popped back up, and I wasn't dizzy when I popped back up, but I couldn't catch my breath. It was a, a strange feeling, like I was suffocating. And another cyclist came along, stopped to see what was wrong, and I talked to him for minute and a half and then some more guys came along and I talked to them so maybe for two minutes I was trying to catch my breath and then boom went went down again uh, and I woke up to an EMT you know putting an IV in in my arm and next thing you know they put me in an ambulance drove me only about 600 yards and then I look up and there's the tail of a helicopter <laughs> put me in a helicopter flew me five minutes to the hospital by the time I got there, though, the, the attending doctor, you know, he cut open my jersey. It was kind of disappointing because it had a zipper up the front. But <laughs> he says, you know, uh, you're stable, but we're just going to keep you here for a while. And I, I felt okay. Everyone kept asking, does your chest hurt? And I said, no, it doesn't hurt. Uh, and they just let me sit there for about half an hour. And then in came the attending cardiologist who wanted to do a test on me right away. Uh, I don't know the name of it. They run a wire up through a, an artery and you- Angiogram, an angiogram, yeah. And I said, it's, it's to check and see if there's any blockages. And I said, I don't have any blockages. I'm healthy as can be. There's no blockages. And I got into a strange banter with this guy and he ended up making a bet with me if I'd agree to do this. I said, all right, I'll do it. So I had that procedure done, and of course there were no blockages. And then they wheeled me up to intensive care, and right off the bat, my wife hadn't even gotten there yet, but he says we're, we're going to have to do a procedure in the morning to put a defibrillator in your chest. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm not doing that. <laughs> and it was just too much all at once. I couldn't take this in, and it was felt very weak, but I felt generally okay. So, you know, that's when my friends showed up at the hospital and said, hey, you know, you were unconscious for 35 minutes. And, you know, I was fortunate, I guess, that one of the first cyclists to come up the mountain behind me, a friend of mine now, is an ER nurse who said, hey, we got to do CPR. And she enlisted a couple of other cyclists, one of them who was riding up, who was a surgeon. So, <laughs> had my own little medical team there and they did CPR for about 25 minutes until one of the riders went up, got the, the park ranger who came down, had a defibrillator. He shocked me three times and I, that's when I woke up to the EMT. So I, I had no idea that that duration of time went by. Um, and oddly enough, I looked back at the heart rate monitor watch I was wearing and my heart rate never went below my resting rate which, you know, is about 41 to 43. So, uh, you know, it's all kind of confusing to me and I wasn't ready to have this defibrillator put in. And the next morning uh, I was ready to go. I had breakfast and I, I wanted out of this hospital. And that cardiologist came back and said, no, we got to put this defibrillator in. And it was quite a battle. He wouldn't let me leave the hospital. Uh, and I said, my daughter's getting married. I'm leaving this hospital, take this IV out of my arm. And, you know, I, I remember the whole time he's sitting there talking to me and he got all the beeps and buzzes and the heart rate over here, but she kept staring at the heart rate. It was about 45 or so. And 
don't know if he was waiting for it to stop or whatever, but he says, you could die any, any second here. And I said, I don't think so. Uh, and the only way I could get him to allow me to leave was if he would have a, like a, a portable defibrillator, something. The vest, the vest. Vest, like a, he the said, this vest. is gonna be like a life vest. I said, you're kidding me. I just had this tailored suit for my daughter's wedding. <laughs> You know, and that's not going to fit under that suit. And that's what my wife said. She was in insurance defense law office. She says, hey, they'll never get it improved, approved by insurance. So just tell them you'll do it and, and we'll, we'll get it later. And so that's how I got out of the hospital by agreeing to get this vest, which I never did, of course. <laughs> and of course, then I came to find out this doctor, he was angry at me for not listening to him. And he had my driver's license suspended. <laughs> which was the ultimate insult. But, I, you know, I went, went on to the rehearsal dinner, went to the wedding, danced with the kids all night. I was, <laughs> I was fine. Next Tuesday, I was on my bike riding back up that mountain, and I've been on my training regimen ever since. Although, just got a new heart rate monitor, a good chest strap, and a Wahoo t kicker. Ticker, um, uh, and it's really changed the way I cycle and the way I watch my performance since then. I've had two years of practicing with that. Right. And I, I've gotten pretty good at maintaining my performance level and trying to keep the heart rate down. That's terrific. So, um, I mean, that's not the end of the story, obviously. Shortly after that event you um so they, they told you that you had had a cardiac arrest right and um you were you were puzzled because your garments you know seem to to show different things you have the absolute you, when you came to my office you showed me the most spectacular graphic that i've ever seen because i, I think you're are you a designer or an architect or you work in the uh, I'm, I'm an architect and you know right the presentations and like that. And what, what Dr. Cadden's referring to is I got on Garmin Connect and I blew up a graph of that whole ride, you know, at a big enough scale so you could see all the changes in the heart rate. And then I put markers in based on the research I'd done, you know, feedback from, from witnesses who were there, the, from the ambulance company, from the helicopter company. And I could piece together exactly what happened to me minute by minute. And it, it tells the story. And you see this heart rate going up and down. It, it's, it's fantastic. I, it, really, it could be um, published as an image in clinical medicine uh, uh, if, if you wanted to share it. But um, so then you, you went to see a, a, a cardiologist as an outpatient, and, and then you had a formal diagnosis made. Because I think when you left the hospital, all they knew was that you had a cardiac arrest. They had done an echo that was, uh, you know, maybe not conclusive or show some abnormalities, but uh, you saw a cardiologist and then you had, uh, I think, an MRI. Uh, yes, yeah, so I went over to Stanford and had an MRI. Yeah. Right, right. And the MRI, what, uh, the, so the diagnosis, can I read the, uh, the, um, uh, the MRI findings? Sure. Okay, so uh, here, the MRI this says, the right ventricle is moderately dilated with globally reduced function. There is a focal aneurysm of the right ventricle with associated dyskinesia, meaning that the, uh, the ventricle, instead of squeezing normally, it, it squeezes abnormally. It squeezes, you know, when the ventricle squeezes, it bulges out. I mean, that's the definition of an aneurysm. Uh, most strikingly, at the superior anterior free wall below the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, okay, I'm sorry. So that's, that's, the, um, that's the, the aneurysm. Then there is some inferior wall dyskinetic segment, you know, again, a segment that doesn't uh, pump very well. Um, and uh, there is, the left ventricle is moderately dilated with mild globally reduced function and the infralateral wall is fat replaced. So, so there's fatty tissue, which again, it's not, about, not based on biopsy, but based on the MRI appearances of the tissue, they think it's infiltr infiltrated with fat. So then the conclusions are, the findings satisfy the major criteria of the MRI component of the 2010 ARVC task force. ARVC is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So it's a specific type of um, disease of, of the heart muscle uh, cardiomyopathy that um, is known to uh, 
produce cardiac arrest, particularly cardiac arrest with exercise. So, so it's one of the entities that uh, I think are, are, are well known to cause cardiac arrest with exercise. And it seemed that the, 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 the MRI uh, findings were not equivocal, at least in the minds of the radiologist and I think in the mind of the cardiologist who, who saw you uh, on an outpatient basis. And, th and therefore that's, that's the diagnosis that, um, that the medical community. And I personally, when, when I saw you, I did not disagree with it also. Uh, your EKG uh, shows T wave abnormalities. Um, again, this is sort of technical lingo, but that sort of goes along with uh, uh, this diagnosis of uh, ARVC. Um, across the precordium. Across the precordium, yeah, across the precordium. And, and the EMTs, when they arrived, you have a strip of ET. Um, let me see what my notes. I mean, they, they I mean they shocked them. They shocked them right. three times, so they Correct. must have. Been they did. Yeah, yeah, they must oh. have. Right. Yeah, okay. We don't have. Yeah. Uh, no family history. This is a, it's it's a condition that tends, you know, can 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 be familial, uh, but there's no family history. John, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but I think your your parents, your father had a cardiac arrest, but very late in life, right in his 80s. Correct. Right. Correct. And uh, otherwise, no first degree relative with with a, a cardiac yeah. arrest. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so um, there's another, so you came to my office and you told me this story and you wanted to have my, my opinion uh, as to what to do. Uh, how, I don't think I was how, very, go ahead, Anisha. How long after did, did you come, did, did, did you come to your office? Two, to Tom? Two, two uh, months. Sorry, so John, I, I, your It was the uh, end of December, I think it was right around Christmas time. So maybe a couple of months later after the cardiac arrest. And um, and, and there I got a little more history from you. Um, you want to tell us about the 2015 event, you know, that, that, you, that you relayed from a couple of years before? Oh, there, there was one occasion when I had passed out before. Is that what you were referring yeah. to? Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that little detail. So uh, yes, riding up the mountain, <laughs> same mountain. <laughs> trying to set a, a Strava, if you know what that is, a Strava PR. Uh, I was just pushing myself insanely. And I passed out again, <laughs> crashed into a tree, <laughs> woke right up, and I was fine. I went down the mountain, just had one small problem. There was a tree branch in my arm, which I had to have surgically removed. But, uh, I, I just... Uh, discounted that experience. So I think when the second time in 2019, when I felt dizzy, that's when I knew, uh oh, you better stop the bike because you can right. fall off. Right. So. But, but in 2015, it was also, I mean, at least in your mind, what you told me, a, a particularly tough ride where you really oh, were yeah. pushing yourself. This to is the insane. I'm trying to, to do something that's uh, you know, when they ran the, the Amgen race up the mountain, we had Tour de France riders here that did this segment in 14 minutes or less. And that's what I was trying to do <laughs> unsuccessfully. But <laughs> right. And you, and you did. And just to be clear, you, you did lose consciousness in 2015. I mean, you actually, you fainted for a few seconds. Yeah, I fit, a few seconds, missed a turn, hit a tree. And right, right, yeah. right. Then you went to the ER at that point, but they didn't, they were focused on your scrapes and and uh, i know i didn't go to the er i went right back to work for a oh. week oh, a okay sw and swelling in my arm and it was painful and i went to an uh, another doctor for my arm and she said hey you've got a chunk of wood the size of a pencil in your in your arm and you got to get that out okay <laughs> <laughs> okay so so you came to me and you were um uh Essentially, you, you had a, a rationale for, by that time, you were fairly educated. You had sort of uh, researched this and um, you understood what a defibrillator is. You, you, uh, you knew the, the, uh, the pluses and minuses. You know, you, you had read a book, <laughs> if we can say, you know, a book co-authored by Dr. Mandrola uh, here. And, and you were telling me that, you know, you wanted essentially, I mean, I, I was, I was getting a sense that you wanted sort of validation for your decision um, of not getting a defibrillator. And, and your rationale was that, you know, first of all, defibrillators have complications. I mean, the main thing is that you said, there's no way I'm going to stop riding. You were going to continue to ride. 
And then there was a chance that this defibrillator will, will, will shock you, not because you had ventricular fibrillation, but it would sort of shock you uh, just because you know, your heart rate was going too fast. And you were very concerned about these inappropriate shocks. And, um, and, uh, and then there was something else that, uh, that you, you, you had, uh, you, you brought to my attention that I don't think was, was apparent to the, to the first doctors that took care of you. But you started noticing that you, you were obviously riding at that, at that point. You, were, you went, we went back on your bicycle very shortly after your cardiac arrest. But you noticed spikes in fast heart rates. Um, that turned out when I examined this and you had had a, a heart monitor were spikes of atrial fibrillation that occurred when brought on by, by exercise and that would immediately stop as soon as you slowed down or, or, or stopped exercising, you would go back into sinus rhythm. And so you had these occasional spikes of very fast heart rates uh, on, your, on, your, on your bicycle, riding your bicycle. Right, right. and I'll, I'll elaborate on that, but I, I don't want to move past one other point I'd like to make is that when I came to see you, I, I, I questioned, and I still do question, the diagnosis of ARVC. I think there's an element of subjectivity in, in there, and I, I don't, I haven't entirely We'll, we'll, we'll address that. I mean, I think this is an important point, that. an important point that, that we will address. But, but what I, speaking about the fibrillation, what I found out was having immediately after this incident started to focus very much on the heart rate, whereas before I always had this data, but I didn't pay much attention. Now I'm staring at it constantly. And what caught my attention is, is moving into those winter months, I would ride indoors and I would have a routine where I would work for an hour at a constant rate, 200 to 235 watts, which is a pretty, pretty hard pace, and try to hold that for an hour. And I would do that same workout twice a week in the evenings. And I notice it's pretty much the same every time. You know, my heart rate goes up into the 130s and it stays there. But then one time I look down and it's 152. And I said, what happened? How did it get to be 152? And what I was doing was checking my pulse. And I said, I don't, I don't feel anything different. I couldn't, couldn't sense this in my chest. And I couldn't feel my pulse that high, but the heart rate monitor is reading it. And that, that kept happening to me. And that's when I, I relayed some more graphs to you. I've got graphs of identical rides, same time of day, same route, same pace, same guys I'm riding with, and the heart rate nice and steady on one and on the other it pops up and it just stays there and once that starts to happen i can't get it to go down during that ride it, it goes up 150 and higher i can i can relax back off but it'll come down but as soon as i start to move right back there so in the last two years i've been working really hard to recognize what causes that to happen and to prevent it because I mean, that could be what causes the perfect storm of what happened to me on the mountain that night. Uh, so. Right. Um, right, so, so essentially you're controlling it by, by sort of backing off. You, you, tell, you told me that you sort of back off from yes. the intensity of the exercise right when you sense that it's gonna go up and it. And yeah, and there's a lot of factors. I've learned that stress, if I'm stressed out at work and I go out there, I'm much more likely to have that happen if it's really hot or really cold, or if I surge suddenly, which in riding in a group, you don't control the pace. So it's been hard for me to say, okay, I'm gonna to have to let those guys go because I'm at 140 right now and I don't wanna surge. And I have to just kind of keep it mm -hmm. right. Um, Cause you can, it, there's been a few cases, I probably haven't told you this, when I, I was almost to where I wanted to be and that push up the mountain and I says, oh, well, the heck with it, I'm just going to keep pushing and it, it will go up to 200 if I don't stop. Right. I think I've recorded a 209 <laughs> at one point in the last two years. So, I'm, I'm, but I've been very successful the last six months in, in stopping that from happening. John, before I, I turn it over to Dr. Mandrola and, and Dr. Coca to, to sort of comment, I, I want you to tell us maybe a little bit about your prior non-cardiac medical experiences uh, with diagnoses being made and, uh, and whatnot, because that, I think, was also a, a factor in your decision. Uh, 
Well, I have a great respect for doctors. My, my grandfather is a doctor. My brother is a doctor. My daughter is a doctor. <laughs> so I think no one respect doctors. But she, if I listened to everything every doctor told me, I'd have a knee replacement. I'd have my thyroids removed. Uh, I mean, I went to three different, at a knee issue, I went to three different guys, and they all said, you need to have a knee replacement. Finally, some guy said, hey, why don't you stop running? <laughs> And you know what? After a, a year of not running, I'm fine. I was to the point where I couldn't walk around because of the pain. And I had a cyst on my thyroid. Ten years ago, they wanted to remove my thyroid. All kinds of treatments were to be had. <laughs> radiology. And you know, why don't we just do an ultrasound and we'll check it every year and see if that thing grows. Any. And it hasn't. It's gotten smaller. So uh, maybe I'm just stubborn guy uh, you know so i mean th this is perfect because the, dr mandrola is 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 really a um, a, a well recognized uh, i mean i wouldn't say an authority but but uh, an outspoken uh, critic of what is called in medicine over diagnosis and and uh, that sort of thing the tendency of doctors to sort of uh, uh, diagnose that? things that uh, but but you know i, I so let me ask Dr. Mandrola his first reactions to this story. <laughs> <laughs> my, my first reaction is that I, it takes me back to it takes me back to my old practice where a partner of mine said a patient came in and like John and explained to him about cycling, and and my partner didn't really have the concept of cycling. He, he thought that bike riding was just riding a beach cruiser. And he, he kept telling me, John, uh, this, isn't, this isn't like weightlifting. This isn't hard. And, and, and I, I wanted to say, Anthony, I said, you have no idea how much pain a cyclist can put themselves through. So I think the first point to make is how stoic cyclists can be and how um, uh, how much they can put pain uh, away and, and push through pain. And it's really an important thing in sports cardiology when you evaluate athletes to understand the mentality of endurance athletes. And, and, and I, 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 John is just so phenotypically classic for uh, an endurance athlete. So that I guess it just shines right through that story. Uh, about you know trying to stay on the wheel of a uh, of a competitor or trying to set a personal best up a mountain. Now now I'm different than John in that um, I've been bike racing. I, you know I was bike racing probably for 20 years, and w when I turned 50, I basically took all of my computers and garments and everything off my bike because every year the uh, watts would go down and it was just bad news. And so I decided the best the way to deal with this was just not to look at it anymore. Now in the winter, I get on Zwift and I, I, I do race on Zwift. And of course we have lots on Zwift because there's nothing else to look at, but that's the first thing that strikes me about John. Yeah. Good. Good. Anish? No, I mean, it, it's just, uh, it's an amazing uh, story and it highlights the, um, how overconfident doctors are about, you know, prognosis. Um, you know, we're, we force the world into these binary yes, no, like if you don't do this, this will happen, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, even when you're talking about uh, ischemic cardiomyopathies, you know, these are folks that have had large scars in their heart because of usually heart attacks. Um, and, and we're recommending defibrillators to them, right? Um, you know, I mean, I mean, that's as good as it's going to get in terms of trying to predict prognosis, but, you know, we put in what, nine, for every nine defibrillators you put in, we have to put in nine defibrillators, right, uh, for to save one person's life. So, you know, eight of those folks are getting a defibrillator and nothing's happening to them, right? Um, and, you know, but, so we, I, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not sure we in medicine lean into the certainty of that. And, um, um, and so, you know, John, uh, John, you don't have a defibrillator, correct? And you're not wearing a life vest. No, 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 I, I do not. Right. So, so, <laughs> right. John, and so, it, just highlight, and this happened all in 2015, 2019, 2019. So, 
2019. Okay. Well, right. Yeah. Although there was that, that event in 2015, which may also or, you right. know, likely may have been. So John's rationale was that um, I mean one of, one of the reasons was that this seems to happen. At least the two events that uh, occurred to him were at really you know all out uh, effort. And then so long as he avoids, you know, going, you know, reaching that level, then maybe he can just avoid the, uh, the defibrillation, the fibrillation altogether. And um, exactly. And I, I think a lot of people that don't fully appreciate what I was doing, push yourself hard up a mountain when you're way beyond your limits. It wasn't just a regular ride. And if, if I can refrain from doing that, I keep myself out of that zone. I, I, I wouldn't do that again. And I, haven't done that again. Uh, uh, like John said, you you watch your PRs go bye bye. And Strava has this new feature now where during your ride it pops up your your PR on certain segments and tells you how you're comparing with what you did in the past. <laughs> Frustrating because you're always behind what you were on your best day. But I, I I've had to maybe part of this is it's my rationale for slowing down a bit, you know, being able to do the group ride and let the other guys go a little bit. You, I used to be that guy out front that was pushing the pace. Now I have to say, all right, I'm going a little easier. But I, I know if I stay out of that that danger zone, I'm I'm gonna be okay. But but can I can I Michelle, can I speak to the and and defend the well, it's kind of funny how you, you, you and Anish put me in this position to defend a position that I would be you know, speaking against often. But I, I want to I defend the, the thinking of the cardiologist that, well, the potential thinking of the cardiologist in John's case. So it, it, I don't know the details. I, it's true. I haven't heard any of this before, but let's just say, you know, John has abnormal T waves. He has abnormal, um, he has period, portions of his ventricle right and left that, that are, you know, abnormal and scar related. And the, the point is that anytime you have a scar in the heart at this island of abnormal tissue that, that rhythms can rotate around and cause abnormalities. And yes, in John's case, it seems to be mostly associated in a couple instances with pushing himself at a certain level that maybe he are, he understands that level. But the point is, is that when there's uh, a scar in the heart, there's a, sort of a, a, a focus or, or a, a potential cause of, of sudden death. And, and the thing with sudden death is, is, is that sometimes there isn't, you know, there isn't another chance. There's just one chance. And so the doctors are saying, okay, uh, I, I'm scared for your life and, and, and you're vital and you're young and you have a family and I don't want you to die. So I'm going to put this defibrillator in to, to protect you. And so that's the thinking of the doctors. And I, I think it's, it's, it's reasonable thinking, but on the other hand, John is a completely informed patient. I, you know, if, if you, if a patient is completely and utterly informed about the, the pros and the cons and the expectations, it is completely a preference sensitive decision to have a, a defibrillator in. And it's, it's, it's absolutely uh, uh, reasonable for him to make this decision. John, do you feel do you feel confident enough about uh, the exercise? You know, the, uh, the heart rate modulation and that kind of staying out of the danger zone. Do you feel confident I, enough about that to sign off on John driving? Uh, I can't. I, I it, it, that would be. I mean, it no, would no, be. It would be. Sorry, I don't mean to put without the looking spot at specifically, the John. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, G generally speaking, or I guess generally speaking, I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot about this. I just, as an electrophysiologist in a patient who's had a cardiac arrest multiple times, who has scar in the heart, um, um, how, yeah, uh, it, se it seems, my, it seems my challenging. Feeling, <laughs> my, my feeling about driving is, my feeling, well, in Kentucky, we don't have, we don't, 
you know, doctors are not compelled to report anything. And, you know, we, we make recommendations and, and we can cite expert opinion and guidelines. But, you know, I ride my bike to work every day. I'm a bike commuter. And, and I ride every day, almost, almost every day on the roads. And so I, I would put any of my VT patients up against this, the average 16 and 17 year old and feel completely comfortable with, with my uh, VT patients with or without defibrillators against a 16 year old that is legal to drive. Right. Uh, indeed. Um, so John, I, I had, um, uh, so my, my reaction was same as yours, uh, uh, Dr. Mandrola, um, that it was reasonable, you know, the, the, the cardiologist's uh, recommendation was reasonable. And in fact, it was my recommendation uh, to John. Uh, and again, you know, so I, I don't have the bias of being a cyclist. So I, I could, you know, I could say, listen, uh, yes, uh, you know, there, there's a chance of, you know, maybe a higher chance of having these, um, 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 uh, these sh shocks, I mean, these, um, what do you call them? I'm, I'm blanking out on the, uh, these um, abnormal, these um, cardiac arrest or ventricular fibrillation. No, no, yeah, but no, no, but I mean, sin meaning sinus tachycardia triggering. Uh, uh, oh, if uh, okay. Uh, tri right, or the AFib triggering the the defibrillators. These um, these unne unnecessary shocks, if you will. Um, there's a chance, but the answer to that would be to just you know give up cycling and whatnot. And it was clear that there was a. Uh, out of the question for John, it was absolutely clear, as you said, that John uh, was completely informed uh, and understood the consequences um, that he was facing, the potential consequences. But then I, I looked at the literature to try to understand a little bit what is the natural, what is the expected natural history of this entity, and the problem is that it's actually hard to know. Because for the most part, people get defibrillators, right? We don't have the cohort of, of Johns who decides not to get the defibrillator and you know, to see what happens in the long term. And, and if for the most part, this becomes a progressive disease and then there's a problem with heart failure and whatnot, well, the defibrillator is not gonna change that, right? It, it doesn't change that natural history. Um, I think it's pretty clear that in, in ARVC in particular, that the VFib arrests are triggered by, by intense exercise. I mean, I, 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 we know that. So, you know, the, the more I read, the more I, it seemed to me that, uh, you, you know, the benefit was more theoretical. It was more like a, a Pascal's wager than, you know, than an informed decision. It was more that, you know, you have so much to lose if you have another VFib arrest that you should get the defibrillator. But did I know for a fact that it was, you know, I mean, a, a convincing uh, intervention that would convincingly, uh, you know, uh, prolong his life or, or, or you know, uh, allow him to, to survive another correct, correct arrest. Uh, I, I really could not uh, come to that conclusion. John, that John, and, John and Michelle, could, could, did, was there any gene testing done? Did you, was there an abnormal gene? I, I, I started to pursue that path. And when I was going to go to Stanford and meet with their group and see if there was a gene. And what they told me was, is that no matter what they found, they could not rule it out because they didn't have enough markers for ARVC. So even if I went there and they found no genes, I would still be in the same position. And, and I said, well, well the, I, I mean, there. I guess... I guess I, I don't want the listeners to think that I'm an expert in ARVC. I mean, I, 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 I know, I mean, I know, I know about it and I understand, I think what's written in the guidelines, but one of the issues is, one of the issues is if it's truly ARVC, one of the fascinating things about this condition is that if, if there is a gene for, for these, these, these uh, proteins that affect muscle binding, that, that that the intriguing thing about it is that exercise can actually make the, the condition worse. And so what the Johns Hopkins people and Hugh Hawkins would say is that if the diagnosis, if there's a diagnosis of ARVC, then um, uh, continuing to do endurance exercise can actually progress the, progress the disease. And, 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 and there's these stories of, of, of siblings who, 
you know, one sibling is a couch potato and is completely normal and one sibling takes up triathlon and then develops this horrible cardiomyopathy and they both have the gene for the disease, but the, the exercise has modified the gene. So one of the things that, that could be important in this is to, to, um, to, to, you know, to have a gene diagnosis. And then if, if there is a true diagnosis of quote ARVC, then you know, modification of exercise might be important because it helps stop the progression of this scar tissue and fatty tissue. John's case is a little unusual because uh, at age 60, I mean, and doing endurance exercise for a long time, um, it, it's, it's, it, you would have thought that this would have presented itself earlier if it was true ARVC. So again, I'm speculating, but, but I, I do think that if one makes the diagnosis of ARVC, I think it is important to counsel patients that endurance exercise could make the, could make the disease worse in terms of not just arrhythmias, but progression of heart failure and weakness of the heart muscle and, and, and these sorts of things that, they, that are really kind of important. Let me ask you this, if, if that was the case and the condition was worsened by continuing to do endurance exercises, shouldn't I see some symptoms that indicate a worsening of my condition? Instead, what I'm learning to do is control AFib and I'm maintaining a, a really good performance level. Now, I just had a strong ride this morning. I feel great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's, there's, uh, I, and again, I haven't reviewed the case, but I just make the point for listeners that I, I, I think that if there's a true diagnosis of arrhythmogenic RV, you know, ARVC, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and there's a gene, I think it is one thing that can be told to a, to a 20 year old or a 30 year old is to, you know, take up golf or chess or something like that, because you're less apt to develop heart failure when you're 50 or 60, but, but John is already 60. And, you know, so, it's also possible that he he is also possible that that you know he just has exercise induced ventricular tachycardia that can be modified by not getting to that level of of exercise. So yeah, um, uh, you know there's there's some there's some I guess gray area of diagnosis here. Yeah, for sure, because uh, you know we we know that ath some athletes. And again, we don't know the significance of it, but if you take super high endurance, you know, elite athletes and elite endurance athletes and do MRIs on a bunch of them, a few of them will have, you know, visible uh, fibrosis or visible abnormalities on their myocardium and whatnot. So do these people, do they have a, some kind of genetic predisposition, even if it's not a full-blown ARVC, but they have some kind of gene that is not as functioning as well and in combination with the super high endurance um, but, but it's, it's so, there's so much uncertainty because how, how can you advise? I mean, imagine if, uh, John carries a gene and the gene had been detected, as you said, you know, at age 20 and he had been told, you know, pick up, um, you know, ping pong, <laughs> you know, so, so he would have foregone 30 years of, you know, great enjoyment and, and whatnot. Now, again, the medical recommendation would be it's worth it because, you know, the alternative is death. Um, and, and it's 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 true at some level. At another at another level, it makes me uncomfortable to um, um, to push hard. So actually, so I didn't. My recommendation was actually for John to get a defibrillator, but I was perfectly comfortable with his decision. The same way you you have been. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, the the frustrating thing is that there really doesn't seem to be any other option. You know, people in your profession they see the situation and they say, "Well, that's that's all I can tell you." This is what you need to do, have a defibrillator. Uh, it's unfortunate that that's... <laughs> do, John, do you, uh, do you think, um, are, you, are, you, do you, are you comfortable with the idea that, um, you know, if you say, don't modulate or say you have some emotional stress during, I mean, are you comfortable with the idea that on one of these bike rides, you may not, come home? I, I guess it's possible. I think, I, I'm, I guess comfortable is the right word. I got to tell you this, if that's the way you got to go, it's not a bad way to go. You just sort of pass out, fall asleep, and you're doing the thing that you love to do best. Uh, I've watched people, the generation ahead of me, suffering in their later years. 
and it's not not an easy path. So if it happens to me someday, I guess that's that's okay. I accept that. I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm comfortable. Yeah. Right. It's so interesting because it, it's it's it, you know I, we we in in certainly doctors that see patients see a whole range of patients, uh, and each patient has their own uh, risk tolerances, their own values that they bring to you, and. I think it's a good reminder uh, for doctors to always be very mindful about uh, what patients' values are, what patients' preferences are, because at the end of the day, it's not so much, you know, my preferences or my values or what I would do. The question is, you know, what, what best works for, for, for you? And certainly there's a massive number of patients that have a huge amount of anxiety related to uh, morbidity and death. You know, you tell somebody that there's a you know, well, if you do this, there's a one in a thousand chance of this happening. And it's like, oh my God, wait, I, you know, no, I don't think this is not something that we can do. You know, so, you know, and, and it's, and a lot of times it's massaging and uh, trying to recommend to folks and trying to make them understand how rare certain things are. But, uh, you know, in, in, in your case, you just, you seem to be, uh, you know, obviously highly informed, very knowledgeable and, um, uh, you know, very understanding of the, uh, of, of the risks, uh, of the risk here. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a great lesson, I think, uh, for us. I, I was curious, John, you said earlier on that you were questioning the diagnosis of ARVC and, and, you know, our prior episode that we did two episodes ago is actually <laughs> up on, uh, uh, the gray areas in the diagnosis of ARVC. Um, your MRI certainly is read in a way, and I don't have the images to review and stuff, but certainly the way they read it. Uh, in terms of regional parts of the heart being aneurysmal and not working, not just the heart being enlarged or whatnot, uh, parts of the heart being replaced by the scar tissue. Um, the way it's read is certainly, you know, con concerning for, for a diagnosis, but of course we never make diagnoses with just images. But I'm curious, uh, are you, did you do some additional research or did you show the pictures to other folks or how, why, wh how, where did you come up with the idea that well, the diagnosis of ARVC is uncertain? You know, when somebody tells you something that I guess you, you start Googling around and whoosh, you get bombarded with information and pros and cons. And I, I've read dozens of times that it's there's some subjectivity in that diagnosis. And, you know, I, I tend to think that specialists tend to see what they want to see or what they expect to see. Uh, so I, I just question it from all heard and my own instincts. I, mean, I know there's something there, there's something isn't right, but is this, is it this ARVC? I, I don't know. And I've really no. put it out of my mind. Right. You know, you're correct that there's subjectivity in diagnosis. In fact, in any kind of diagnosis, um, because the diagnosis ultimately is a, is a decision, is a clinical decision by a doctor. Um, even though we have the impression that we're identifying, right, we're describing something, at the end of the day, when you apply the label, it's actually a clinical judgment, meaning you judge that there's sufficient evidence to call this entity X and to trigger treatment Y, you know, and, and doctors can disagree. So when there's a lot of evidence, most doctors will tend to agree, right? When there's very little evidence or the evidence is, 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 uh, is very, um, you know, maybe flimsy or whatnot, then you, you can have doctors that really strongly disagree with one another. I think in this particular case, I mean, I don't know for, you know, we haven't taken a poll, but I, I'd be, I'd be um, confident that most doctors would sort of accept this, uh, this diagnosis of ARVC, that uh, they would all judge it in the same way and say, okay, I'm, you know, there's sufficient evidence to call it, you know, this. Um, but what we don't know, because it's a, it's a rare entity, it's a, you know, is we, we don't know whether, you know, well, it's natural history, you know, uh, we certainly know enough to tell you not to push yourself <laughs> very hard. We, we tend to, to recommend um, uh, AICDs, but as I said before, we don't, we don't have uh, any, um, you know, if you want to be a, a strict purist, there's a, a colleague, friend of ours, uh, Vinay Prasad, who will always look for overall survival of any intervention. So we don't know about the overall survival of a defibrillator being implanted in, in, uh, in, uh, in patients with uh, ARVC. Um, but um, the other thing I wanted to mention about the, this risk tolerance is um, it was important to me that you came with your wife and I could sense that she, she was on board too. It wasn't just you know, your own 
you know, prerogative and is sort of He's uh, never far uh, away. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, but that, that was important, you know. If she had been, you, you know, uh, if I could sense that there was a real tension there, it, it I, I might have uh, intervened a little bit stronger in in one way or another. Well, I, I know she's not supposed to be talking, but when the doctors who I had met with wanted, that when they pulled out the last stop, it was, "What about your family? What about <laughs> what is that going to do to your wife?" You know, that that was the strongest they had to play so i think she's comfortable with that she she wants me to be happy here and now while i'm i'm doing what i'm doing well john this is uh you know it's, dr it's, mandrola yeah go ahead any sorry sorry uh, can can you uh, is do you think a part of the goal of um uh, of raising, uh, you've done a, a lot of um, bringing up the uncertainty of many of the things that we do. Correct? That 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 that's something you talk about a, a lot, which is which is a very real thing. Um, is, is the is the goal to to have patients understand and realize uh, that um, that uncertainty exists? Is the is the goal to have more patients be like Tom? And uh, would that solve our problem of overdiagnosis in the U.S. health system? Well. You know, I don't think, I think, I think my thinking has come around on this over the years. I think the main reason to inform patients is, is not to reduce healthcare costs. And I think the main reason to inform patients is because it's the right thing to do just, just on yeah, yeah. moral grounds that it, it is right. And, and um, it ends up, I think, I, I, it ends up, I think, probably, you know, reducing excess low value care um, if patients are informed. I mean, I mean, that's the thing about shared decision making. And, and what, one of the things that I like to use, uh, not so much for rare conditions like like Tom, like John's, but 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 like for common decisions, if you use a decision aid where you actually lay out the, the actual risk reductions from taking, say, for instance, a statin or anticoagulants, the, 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 the dilemma is that when patients really understand how little difference some of the things that we do makes, they, they might not choose what we think or what guideline writers think is, is the best option. And, um, and, but in the end, I mean, we, we have so little effect on outcomes that, that it ends up being, being okay. So, so yeah, it's it's a it's a paradox about shared decision making, but I I, I think it's just the right thing to do, um, and and you know the other comment I make about I, I, about John's comments and and feelings is that the whole existential notion and and you know my wife is a hospice and palliative care doctor, so you know every you know, almost all of our stories are about patients who are dying and usually it's of some terrible condition. So I've been on Tuesday night rides. We have a practice race and practice criterion that we do. And I've, I've literally been on the brink of thinking, that's it, John, you're, you're, you're dead tonight. You're not going to survive. And then I think to myself on my ride home, that would be a good way to go. That would be better, you know, than pancreatic cancer or a brain tumor. And, so, you know, I, I, I just, I think we, we do ourselves a disservice by not thinking about uh, our, our mortality and our, our time on this earth and, 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 and about these things. And some people thinking about death is morbid, but I actually think it's life-giving. I mean, and, and so I appreciate John's comments ab about that. Thank you. This is, uh, you know, stimulating. I mean, there are so many different ways to, to approach it. I, um, I, I've written against this concept of shared decision making. Uh, I'm actually <laughs> an outspoken critic of it because I think it's uh, essentially, uh, it can be a, a little bit of a dereliction of, of responsibility. I see doctors saying, well, you know, here's, here's the risks, you make a decision. You know, and it can be, uh, you know, terrifying or, or, or befuddling for, 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 for a lot of patients. Now, I, I'll make an exception for the case where it's purely a preventative, you know, where there's so much, on, on, you know, there's clear uncertainty. And it's a, it has to do with prevention, right? Which prevention is almost not a medical decision. 
prevention is almost right. I mean, you, you can say, you know, when you have somebody who's healthy, it's not really a medical decision. You have somebody like John, I mean, he's healthy in the sense that what we're trying to prevent is not occurring. It's, it's not something we're not trying to change the course of something that's going right now. We're trying to alter the possibility of something happening in the future. I think in that case, um, I wouldn't call it shared, shared decision-making, but I would call it, you know, it's perfectly okay for patients to, to choose what I would not choose. Okay, but it's, it's his decision. It's not a shared decision. I'm not, if I, rec you know, my recommendation was for him to get a defibrillator, to quit writing and to, to, to take it easy and to play ping pong. He doesn't want a decision and I'm perfectly, okay, but it's his decision. It's not a shared decision. I'm not, uh, so it, it may seem like a minor distinction, but I, but I think it's, a, to me, it clarifies a little bit the, what doctors do. Well, I would only push back in saying, Michelle, I think that you, I think that, I, I think that the example you, you, you give is really more of just giving patients a menu and that's almost closer to abandonment. I mean, uh, I, 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 see, I see the doctor's role and I see my role as sort of an advisor and, 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 and a, an advocate and, and almost like a teacher to a student where, you know, if, if someone has a very high stroke risk and they don't wanna take an anticoagulant, um, my job isn't to say, okay, it's your choice, have at it. It's my, I, I, I sort of explain to them what, why we think this and why a doctor thinks this, but, but in the end, it's ultimately their decision and whatever they decide, I support them. I mean, I don't not take care of patients who smoke or not take care of patients who, you know, don't lose weight. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just, it's just important to be an advisor, but also to be, you know, to be their caregiver as well. Right. Right. Now, I, I would I, I also want to say for the listeners that, I mean, I am an avid cyclist. I love Tuesday night criteriums. And, and I, I, you know, I would if I if my wife wouldn't divorce me, I'd think about going back to bike racing. I mean, I, I, I love it. I'm just too old for it now. But but um, uh, I also agree with your decision that in the, the best case scenario for John is for him to is, is to have a defibrillator for backup so that he couldn't die of, of ventricular tachycardia and to take up something like yoga or golf or, 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 or whatever. But, but if he chose not to do that, I would still take care of him and support him and be his advocate. Great, uh, John, this has uh, really been a <laughs> fascinating uh, story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's an anecdote that is very important because medicine is just a bunch of anecdotes. And we learn and we, we inform our judgment as, as uh, doctors through our interactions with patients and through the experiences that people like you provide us. So thank you for sharing it. Uh, thank you for sharing it with me um, uh, early on and, and for giving us a follow-up here. It's really, yeah. really wonderful. And um, uh, John, yeah. I'll have to tell you that, uh, you know, your uh, story, John, Michelle has told me your story before. I think a few years ago, you told me a story when it, around the time you first met you, or maybe six months after, something like that. Then I told him about a patient of mine, and we brought him uh, brought him in to do a podcast very similar to this two months ago, or no, sorry, two episodes ago, so about a month ago. And then John, uh, you know, Michelle reminded me again about the story. And I'll have to say, I hope I'm not offending, but Michelle, Michelle's, you know, the, 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 the Michelle, the, the, I don't remember the exact words, but basically Michelle was like, I'll have to see if John's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm very happy to see you <laughs> sitting here. The podcast. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Real pleasure getting to speak with all of you, gentlemen. Uh, can I mention the really good <laughs> this, this really good book called The Haywire Heart? By oh yes, 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 it's yes. right here. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right, we'll put a link to that book on the show notes. <laughs> 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 All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Right. Have a good rest of the day. Bye. Right.